I did, but in in a general way, it was lost in the noise. At that time, I didn't know the family, and I didn't know him, so it was one of the casualties of the war to me. You know, when I first became conscious of McCain in this way as a prisoner, was to it was at the end of the war. And I was in Hanoi to negotiate the schedule of the release of the prisoners. And I had established a schedule on the basis of whatever principles we had adopted. And on my last night in Hanoi, one of the leading Vietnamese said, as a sign of goodwill, we will let you take Commander McCain with you on your plane. And I said, I won't take him. We've just established a schedule, and I'm not going to make a personal exception. And of course, I also thought in the back of my mind, if the first prisoner out is the commander of the Pacific Fleet, uh, that cannot, that would be very inappropriate. And I knew his father at that time, so it was the wrong thing to do at that moment. So then after, so John had to stay for three more months. So after he came out, there was a reception for all the prisoners in Washington. And Commander McCain came up to me and said, I want to thank you for saving my honor. And he didn't tell me that he had been offered this release two years earlier. So that was the beginning of our friendship. And so McCain has always had an extraordinary moral stature in my eyes. I knew his father. His father was Pacific Fleet Commander. And uh, it was a perky uh, <coughs> inspirational man. He commanded, he was think pack, he was that meant, he commanded the theater. So all the military action we ordered in uh, Vietnam when it was ordered was carried out by him. Never once did he mention his son. And never once did he ask for information about his son. He may have had other sources, but in his dealing with the White House, he was the think back. And whenever we thought that President Nixon needed a little shot in the arm, we we arranged a briefing by Admiral McCain. So that's, uh, I, did, I didn't know the event two years earlier, and he never told me. McCain thought that when his country was at war, he had a duty to do it uh, as successfully as he could. So when he came in, he did not say, he didn't give a rah, rah, rah speech. He simply explained his missions and what he was doing in a way that made you believe, that made you, here is a man who can do it and who will do it. 
and he, but he didn't do it with inspirational phrases or patriotic statements. He just acted like a man who felt he had a job that had been assigned to him by the president, and he was telling us how he was doing it. Admiral McCain was during the Christmas bombing, as he was during every other operation. He received his orders, he made his recommendations, but there was nothing in his bearing, or, and never in his words, any reference to his son. Uh, and now, and, but it's important also to understand what the Christmas bombing was. It's been represented in some of the media as a massive bombing of civilians. Uh, the Christmas bombing was the use of B-52s against tactical targets in, ha in Hanoi and, uh, and in, in other, uh, and the tactical targets were mostly anti-aircraft uh, uh, batteries. And even the Vietnamese have claimed, I think, less than 2,000 casualties from the whole period of the, the Christmas bombing. Uh, but, uh, of course, the prisoners were in what was called, the, what later called the Hilton, the Hanoi Hilton, which it was not, that was an ironical description of it. And they certainly saw it going on around them. Uh, they weren't hit, but it was. Now, why was it important? We had been negotiating for five years, and we had been uh, sort of tormented because they would always come up with just one more request and they always dangled the prisoners at, at the final thing at the end of the line. And we always argue, felt that having fought for these many years in several administrations, we had to end the war with something other than just returning prisoners. And so the issue was, uh, uh, what kind of political structure could we agree to? And I, I won't go in, into any of those details, but President Nixon decided, and I agreed, that we had reached a point where only a shocking event that would show to them that this gradual escalation or the gradual conduct of the air war would no longer that work and that we were absolutely determined to bring the war to a conclusion. The Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, had already agreed to one draft, and so it was a question of relatively marginal issues case by case, but not in their totality. So it was so President Nixon decided to use B-52s against military targets wherever they appeared. And the whole uh, so-called Christmas bombing lasted less than two weeks. So this was not a prolonged action, but uh, it brought home to them that the period of procrastination was over. I never heard, and I don't believe it happened, that Admiral McCain talked to the president about his son. It would be against the code of honor of the McCains that they would ask for a special dispensation when they were serving the country. There was an investigation that was run by Senator Kerry 
Edward Bowen about the fate of prisoners demanding an action, uh, which is the first time I saw the, the two together. And at that time, Kerry appeared, at least to me, as a in a more hostile form than he later emerged. Uh, but at some point, I don't know the exact date, the two devoted themselves to make, giving meaning to the normalization of relations that was in the process of occurring. And I know the Senate uh, took several trips to Vietnam uh, without any ill will for the torture he had systematically received while he was a prisoner. And I always associated him in my mind with all the efforts, the various efforts that were made to bring back the relation to Vietnam to not only to normalcy, but to a way in which the two societies thought of each other in a constructive manner. He was more forgiving than I was. Senator McCain became a close friend. We met frequently. We talked even more frequently. Uh, because uh, in a period of enormous divisions in this country and, and considerable self-righteousness, here was a man who stood for fundamental principles. And it didn't matter whether you agreed with him or didn't agree with him. It was important to have somebody of such a tower of integrity so that even those who disagreed with him could feel that this was not a personal issue. For example, he and I, close friends as we are, uh, have disagreed on the diplomacy to conduct vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. And when he was a presidential candidate, uh, uh, at the Republican convention, he spent three hours of lunch inviting me to hear my view on how, how it should be done, uh, which was different from his, from his view. And still he was kind enough for many periods afterwards to introduce me to his committee by saying that he was the, that I was a person who had a major influence on his thinking. So that was in, and the national divisions have not become less in this period. But here was somebody who would show you what the country in its best principles could represent and what your duty was and whether you agreed on every tactical uh, thing or not uh, doesn't matter and so I, he, he ran for president and he didn't make it but he uh, represented a continuity of faith and dedication that was presidential, if we are lucky, in its qualities, if we are lucky in our president. You know, the ordinary principles of how you get by in the Senate uh, he, uh, they, they, you, you could point out a certain lack of willingness to compromise and that he was not a backslapping individual who ingratiated himself into such a way that you, it would break your heart to not give him something. 
John McCain saw through his problems, and then he developed a conviction, and then he stood by this conviction. But that was inspirational to, to many people, and the country will remember him uh, after he's gone as a man who kept up the importance of certain convictions and who was never affected by the tactical maneuvering of the moment and, and the career orientation. Uh, uh, there are many episodes in his campaign. He wouldn't use certain arguments against Obama because he thought they might be interpreted or used as racial uh, or based on racial. And he wouldn't even consider them. And uh, so there was, on the one hand, very strong for his convictions, but also very strong for basic principles of America. And I think that will be his lasting contribution. You might get the impression that I'm somewhat prejudiced. Well, it would have been hard to take the pre vice presidential candidate of a previous run within the same time period. Uh, but it's McCain. He thought it was the best man, it was a reasonable judgment. Lieberman is a strong and valuable personality on substance. It would have been a good choice. Somebody told me, uh, it's shocking. It was shocking because I had sort of thought of McCain as a permanent feature. And uh, I called him often. And we talk, and characteristically, uh, he won't talk about his illness, except in a very general way. So most of our conversations are normal conversations that we've had over many years. Uh, I try to call him every week. And, uh, and I do, uh, I sometimes miss the exact week, but uh, the country will lose a conscience. We have to hear from McCain or somebody like McCain, even if we're not going to do all the things he wants, uh, just as a sort of a beacon so that you know what one line of thought should be because you know it is unselfish. You know it is not based on career. You know that he has thought deeply about the country. So as I had said, I don't always agree with him, but I always agree with his motive and with his commitment. And what we need is to bring along an, another generation of people in this present world where when you talk to college kids. They're very career-oriented, and they are sort of planning what is most practically useful for them. Uh, and that's becoming more and more prevalent because of the way communications now uh, 
now operate to have a sort of a rock uh, to, at, to which you can look. And of course, it shouldn't be just one person. There should be, hopefully, a group of people like this. So that's what we will lose. And you will find in your interviews that many people who were on the other side uh, will miss him. It's important to him to demonstrate that America is strong enough to admit its shortcomings and overcome them. I think it's a important task. It's characteristic of him who was tortured that he would want to make sure that his country cleans itself of, of this. I wouldn't give it the same priority, although I think it's important. I spoke at the Naval Academy, but his son was under some restriction. He had sort of broken some rule. It was not a, a major event, but they wouldn't alter it. I finally saw him at the end of my visit, but they didn't build him into the visit uh, the way you'd expect from the son of a close friend. I lived with him in Vietnam for three months, and I knew him over many years. Uh, he, uh, he and Nelson Rockefeller were always friends, but sometimes rivals. But he is another one who is a public servant type. Uh, like McCain, not of the same, I mean, I mean, it was a different field, but I, I'm delighted I, I knew him well. Senator McCain came to my 90th birthday party, and maybe you can get that clip. My daughter has a video, or somebody in my family has a video on it. And there were a number of distinguished speakers. Kerry spoke, Clinton spoke, Schultz, and, uh, McC and John McCain went up and said, I have only one thing to say. Uh, what he said when he met me, that I want to thank Henry for saving my honor, was the most effective speech. But if you want a really positive view, talk to my wife. Oh, she is absolutely smitten with him. And she's basically, she makes no concessions either, so she, she loves that.